What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Guitar Guts Podcast with me, Mark Murray, and my guest today is Marcus Johansson of the band Them and many other bands. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Them is a crazy, um, almost King Diamond style metal band. Awesome guitar riffs, great band. Hey guys, before we get into the podcast, I want to remind you that the all new Halloween album that I did with my friends, The California Werewolves, is out now. You could go over to guitarguts.com and stream it there, listen to it on any of the big streaming platforms. We got Spotify links, iTunes, Amazon Prime, Google Music. If you scroll down below that, you could actually find the newest episode of the podcast is posted there every single week. And if you scroll below that, you'll find the merch page. You can get the Guitar Guts shirt, the all new coffee mugs, which turned out so cool. There's the limited edition Iron Age guitar picks. This one is uh, the current one that's out, but they I only get them in limited quantities. Of course, the, uh, the CDs are all over there. I want to thank you guys so much for your support so far. And also remember, Black Album Month is coming January 2020. Now let's get into the episode with Liquid Charlie. Hey, what's up, Marcus? Mark, how you doing? Doing good, man. How about yourself? All right. How is this? Uh, how's this looking on your end? Looks good. Damn, right, cool. you got some gear behind you. Yeah, I figured that was you know I may as well set up shop where where the gear porn could kind of lean in and out of the frame and all that. Plus with the other guitar. When you said you wanted guitars, I was like, okay, we'll see what we can uh, we'll see what we can do for that. So. Awesome. Oh, you got yourself some coffee there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That gets me all through the day. Cheers to you. I'm doing the same thing right now. Oh, there you go. Yeah, right right on. Yeah. Cool. So, um, dude, I was just looking at your Instagram profile, looking at the list of all the bands that you're in. Are you in all those bands still right now? Yeah. Yeah, I keep it pretty updated. Um, I, uh, I figure... Most, I think there might be one or two that are more like less, we'll call them less than active. And then some of the other ones are like hyperactive. So it, it's just kind of more like our, some of them have like albums that would like to come out at some point. But it's just kind of a matter of just, you know, juggling everything. And when things make the most sense, you know, it's it's some of the projects, it's like if they're not really on labels or if it's more like indie stuff with me and a couple other guys like it's not really as big of a rush to just what would you call it? like a rush to flush like you get it done you put it out there and then everyone just kind of grabs at it randomly from all over the place you get your you get your coffee money from spotify and uh and then that's just kind of the way that that balances out but yeah uh, uh, keeping keeping busy with uh, as much of it as you can you know until you can't keep it anymore yeah, man, you're. I mean, it looks like you're in. I think six six things you got projects you got going on right now. That's pretty significant. I mean, as far as original uh, bands, um, obviously them is sort of the big the big thing that I've got the biggest sort of I won't call it commitment, but you know, we did that new record that came out um, last October was SPV Steam Hammer. Uh, We'll have another one of those uh, coming down the pipeline pretty soon. Uh, you just reminded me the other day, you were like, the singles sound good. And I'm like, the singles from the album? What? What?" And I'm like, oh, all right. That was the the sort of bonus, um, what do they call it, a seven inch. So it was like a, a storyline track that kind of continued off the album. And then uh, that uh, Goblin cover, the, the 70s Dawn of the Dead soundtrack movie band they did all those like argento films and stuff i love that band so that was just so much fun to do so so simple so just so delightful <laughs> i forget how i found them originally but i fell in love right away i i love king diamond and when i found them i was like no way it's like king diamond modernized with uh, e like even better in some aspects and it's awesome dude I, how did you guys all get together how did you guys start as a king diamond cover band Um, the only person that was involved in the tribute band was the vocalist, which makes the most sense because that's probably across the globe. Maybe there's a handful of people that sound like King to a degree. And then it's just that that's like the hardest piece you'd figure to find. Um, none of the members of the band as an original band 
were involved in the tribute. I so, see. so he, um, we'll just call him KK, the character from the the, the vocal character and the storylines and everything. Uh, he was uh, in Long Island. That was his tribute. He did a couple of shows. Um, the, the backstory on that. Well, more than a couple, I think, but he did a couple with members of King's band when King was out of commission for a while there. Uh, I think Al Patino had come over and Mike Weed even did a show or something. So like he had like King members fade in and out to do stuff, which is kind of interesting for a tribute on any level that someone would involve themselves to that degree, um, especially now, uh, because then... Uh, he met the other guitar player, Marcus Ulrich, uh, who I believe he was playing Prague Power. Marcus was. Um, I'm guessing it was Landfear. He's another one. If you think I'm in a lot of shit, so is he. He is in a ton of he's got he's just got like a stack of albums waiting constantly. He just like he puts an album out and then like the next one's already coming out. He's he's phenomenal. Um, so the two of them met somehow in that facilitated um he wanted to do kk wanted to do an original version he wanted to take that and, and do that um but springboarded it into i want to tell this other story and all this stuff so it is very similar in the aspects of like king had the concept records so the first them record sweet hollow um they wrote that together um the story matched up with the songwriting. Uh, and then a buddy of mine, uh, drummer Kevin Talley, who most recently was, I think the last thing he was actively involved with was Suffocation. But I mean, it's like Dying Fetus, Camara, the Slayer audition. Kevin, if you, if you look at Kevin's sick drummer Wikipedia, there's probably about 20, 25 just insane bands. Hate Eternal. Um, he was playing with suffocation and suffocation used to rehearse i believe at kk's house so like the album's done and all that kind of shit's going on and then he's playing he gets kevin like interested in doing the drums for the first record because that's who did the drumming on the first them record kevin talley and then kevin was like hey you should call my friend marcus so by the time i got called in to do stuff it was really just like i did like i think maybe a little more than half a dozen solos on the first record because it was already done. And they were like, hey, you want to be a part of that? And I'm like, of course. But writing a song for something that's already basically a story completed start to finish is like, well, you know, I don't know how that would have worked. Um, so it was just sort of, that's a very long-winded version of how did this come about? Everyone, uh, Marcus Ulrich is actually, he lives in Germany. That's another important piece of the puzzle. So like he's, in Germany with the keyboard player, uh, Richie. Um, so everybody was just kind of all over the place. And that's kind of how most of my albums come together anyway, because everyone can just like you and me here, uh, in the internet, you can just find people, message people, figure it out, file share, get stuff going back and forth. And that first record parlayed into a six or seven show run with Halloween back in 2015, I think it was. Uh, so we opened for them here in the States. Uh, and that was even before the first record had come out. And then it kind of did that underground cult following thing. A couple runs over in Europe. And the next record we had pretty much to go. And SPV uh, reached out. We, we did the deal with them. Did some dates on that. And everything's just, I mean great crew everybody in that crew is just awesome it's so much fun um but as you pointed out as a king fan you could either be loved or hated for thinking that it had interesting things or that it was in some ways different or better or this or that it's a very divided sort of hard love or hard hate really there's not like a casual listener unless it's somebody that's just like i've never heard of king that's like maybe uh -huh. the most casual fan base that we can get into otherwise it's either like fuck these guys or fuck yeah these guys so it's you know one of those two it makes for interesting reading on the internet yeah i'm sure it does i bet you it sucks half the time but it's also but not even half the time but those bad ones they always are seem to be the ones that cut through 
I mean, there was a time we were all hanging out on one of the European runs, and we were just all sitting around drinking some beers at uh, uh, Lula's house, and we went on. Someone had put up the first record in its entirety on YouTube, because that's just what, what you do these days, I guess. And it had a pretty good amount of heat on it, good and bad. Like, we were reading the comments and just having a good laugh, like people fighting back and forth. Some people had some really good slams. Other people were just like, all right, you don't even know what the hell you're talking about. Because that's, you know, there's so much into this, just like with, you know, talking about just we get into a guitar conversation. It's a very easy to just kind of graze over the whole thing and be like, oh, yeah, let's just oversimplify everything. And act like, oh, no, but that's shit because, because of this. And you're like, well, or this is going to sound like this because I bought this amp. Like the, the pair of Marshall Mode 4s over the shoulder there. People love those. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> We're starting to like tour. Did you guys tour after the first record? I mean, the that little Halloween run. It was before it had come out. I think we um, we had like a three or four song EP, which was just a couple songs, basically like advanced off the album. Um, so we did have that and merch and things of that sort, but um, it hadn't come out yet. Um, and then trying to think back here so we did that run that was cool you know halloween awesome bigger venues like i think we did um uh what the hell it's across the street from capitol downtown or not downtown but in, in hollywood there um avalon avalon is that right oh maybe it's changed was... names or whatever but but yeah it was in, we did that one in hollywood it was like the end of the run uh, a couple you know better Buy in New York or PlayStation, whichever that one was in Times Square. They all just keep changing names, and that's a sign of the like awesome state of the industry that the venues are just if they're still there, they're just cycling through a different name, a different owner. Glad to be there still. But um, all right. Cool. So when you guys were when you jumped into them, what what were you playing? What kind of guitars and what was your rig? You got a ridiculous setup back there behind you. Uh, and that's, I don't even think half of this is even really in the constant rotation. Uh, at the time, I was using the the EVH 50, 50-watt, uh, 50 the 606 version, though, because it was back when they, the EL34 hadn't come out. Um, and pretty much was straightforward into that. I think I used um, an 11 rack for the, like, Post effects, pretty pretty straightforward. For, for a lot of years, it was plug and play, and then I managed to just get myself into these, uh, into the modeling world, and into all of that kind of shit with just way too much, way too much uh, stuff going on with in front of the amp, behind the amp, all that kind of stuff. But it's it's too much fun. But um, so yeah, that was, and then for that, I was using an LTD. I don't actually have that one here ready to go, uh, but it's one of their uh, art series type of thing with like all the horror theme. Like they have a bunch of those that are the different horror movie artwork on the body. This one was the the heavy metal movie artwork. Um, but you know it was cool. Yeah, you know great guitar, solid, solid as fuck. Love that guitar and did the job. Just straightforward. Um, we don't really cycle through a lot of sounds with them. It's pretty straightforward as far as just like maybe we need a clean tone for like a minute. <laughs> other other than that, it's just like the rhythm tone and then you know boosted lead and and just and just go from there. On the most recent uh, Euro run that we did, uh, we were both using the Helix Stomps. So. You know, everything just is direct as possible. But we all, you know, we roll in where we can, if it needs to be mic'd up, we can route the signal one way. If the sound guys prefer to use mics, otherwise we're always, uh, same thing with all of my local work here with all the tribute bands. Everything direct all the time is super convenient and is making it as idiot proof as possible. So that no matter, you know, consistency everywhere you go from venue to venue you can kind of spot it and go, something sounds different. I didn't change anything. So mm -hmm. someone else changed something. So then you can kind of, you know, at least maintain some kind of stability there. Because 
in the gear nerd convos and all that kind of stuff, I just really appreciate that so much of the modeling these days is taking these steps to plus with the amount of gear and different things like that, like the Digitech drop pedal is huge for me with like the tribute stuff because we're doing like two hour sets and some of them I don't even have time to change. Like tunings will change, but I don't have time to change guitars because the drummer just clicks off the next one and we're just going, 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 going. And as much as there's some latency or um, most of the drop tuning stuff, even if you do it on board with the effects units or not, none of them sound as good as just switching a guitar that's in a different tuning ever. It'll never, you know, everyone will say that is like a critique and it's like, well, you can agree with that and also still use it because it's just practical. Like where you're just like, I, I don't have any other option. Um, that's a, that's a big piece, but them, everything D standard, same, no, no need to switch, no need to go crazy. You know, we walk in with a guitar, you know, with a spare, and keep it real. Uh, keep it real simple. Let's see what. But, what let's see one of those axes. Yeah. So this one was my uh, most recent Euro run. This one I think is very similar. You have like the Edwards version. This one is just an LTD with the uh, twenty-seven frets. Don't you have the Edwards that's got the the uh, the, the longer neck on there? Yep, I got the same thing with the uh, slanted neck pickup and 27 on, like, the last three strings or so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, where it's the diagonal cut, so it's 27. It's not quite out all the way across. This one, I kind of, uh, even though it's after, it's an afterthought, um, I have some of those FU tone upgrades with the uh, titanium blocks in there and the titanium... Uh, what the hell are these called? Whatever the hell these are at the bottom end. The string saddle stuff, uh, the, the noiseless springs. You can kind of see the white cutting through in the back there. And then they have, like, the titanium locks. Like, they have all the different things to really try to optimize your sustain and uh, really beast out the guitar. But, you know, at the end of the day, they're full-on, like, the full-on bridge with all the extra big, extra-large black grass blocks and all that kind of stuff. Um, would be the optimal move, but I've, I've upgraded a few little pieces on this one because this one's not very, not very high end, not very expensive, and that's kind of my gimmick, though, because I mean this is still a neck through, even for being I think it was only a, a Chinese LTD or whatever. And as I'm not trying to knock it, but I'm more or less referencing people that are knocking it elsewhere. <laughs> Just from doing that, it's like it's not the ESP, it's not the E2, um, but throwing them in a you know in a, a Gator gig bag and tossing them on a plane and having to check them and are they going to check them? Are they going to toss them? Like I watched someone take it from me to gate and literally drop it on its face. Idiots. And you're just like, uh, all right, thank you. Like why did well, you I? You can't say anything about it, or you could get in trouble. Exactly. I, I'm always joking with people. I don't really want to meet the air marshal. So, you know, there's not much you can do or say. And I'm just happy that if we can get it on the plane at the end of the day, because they're very, some airlines love that you want to check them. Or if you want to get to gate check them, you got to like bribe them almost and be like, can I just get it to the plane and then have you destroy it just from there to the plane instead of running it through the, the entire airport on a maze of all of that other bullshit. Um, let's see. Uh, this one... This is actually one of the E2, an E2 M1. Just uh, one pickup off, you know, no, no bullshit. Uh, I have a coil tap on here for the fastback guitar pickups that I use. A company in Seattle, they are super awesome, very high gain. Um, we have a, I'll get to that later, but they made me a signature pickup that, is, that I really love. Um, I use this in the them, uh, video for as Sage Burns. Um, this is another one that just, this one, you can really feel the difference. It's built like a tank. It's another neck through, but you know, for all the people that 
like to kind of ESP, E2, LTD, Edwards, you know, and then there's like the factions of, oh, this is good, this is better, this is best, and you're like, yes, but also I have a piece of me that dies every time someone else knocks it over on stage or not, you know, does something else or traveling with them, like that. With, as you pointed out, like being in a lot of bands, different bands require different needs, different tunings, different sounds. Um, so I can't just, you know, yeah, sure, I could sell five or six different guitars and get one really nice one. But then if I have to adjust the Floyd every other day to change a tuning and to do all that kind of shit, it's like that's not very practical. So, you know, standing out in the heat for two three four times the best and stuff like that like the next i'll give and react differently so it's always a very touch and go kind of thing this one will be kind of interesting this one's the most interesting i think that i have this is an epiphone uh usa model with an explorer headstock from like i think 1989 it's like 89 or 90 so it's like a super strat um this this one 24 frets on the angle, not 27. Wow, but very, that thing's but, crazy. But very similar. So it's got the, I believe, the uh, German Gibson Scaler, 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 however, <laughs> my German German friends will make fun of me. Um, but yeah, I mean, for, you know, bolt-on, but still a USA with a Gibson headstock and all, or Sorry, the Explorer head, headstock. I was just like, wow, that's friggin' wild. And um, if anything, this one's definitely a prime candidate for for somebody like you to touch up and <laughs> and absolutely redo the paint on the body and all that kind of stuff. Because this one's definitely got some bizarre wear and tear on it. And I really don't know if it's... it's it looks like it's the original paint, but... It also looks like it's been through a little bit of a little bit of a time, so that Man, one is that, very crazy. That's a trippy guitar. I've never even seen that guitar before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, very interesting. It's like when they try to jump in and compete with, I'm guessing all the Kramer and everybody Charvel. Everybody was just. Sam Bora and all those guys doing the different crazy models and the paint jobs and all that kind of shit. And I don't know who's being sued over what these days, but it's an interesting, definitely an interesting piece. The most interesting that I have just the whole, the whole guitar could be shot, but the, the, the headstock for me was the selling point. I was just like, it's a regular, a regular guitar with the Explorer headstock. So we'll segue that into, an actual Gibson, if it'll come from here. So USA Explorer 2010, I believe. Uh, this one I threw on the uh, the FRX. So it's got the Floyd FRX on it, which wow. is insanely easy to swap in and out on something like this. I, I believe the only... Um, the only mod that really needs to happen is up around the headstock here. There's two extra screws that need to be put into place. And then everything else just drops in on pre-existing hardware and locations and stuff like that. And then from there, it's just setting up a Floyd. And uh, I actually feel that these unison bend much better than any other Floyd and any other model, the high end Floyds, the lower Floyds or whatever. I've had a bunch of different Floyds. Um, I feel like these really behave differently because they're not, you know, they're not like counterbalanced through the body and all that kind of shit. So it's a very, I don't know. And then you, the best part about it is if you hate it, you can take it off, put the old bridge back on. Yeah, that's really cool. I've seen those before. I've never tried one. Yeah, I I, I um, had to do a very specific show and thought I'd like to be able to do use this guitar, but also have the the Floyd and people. I 
I think they say people try routing guitars for these, and I'm assuming that means like aftermarket digging through the back and actually like carving out the cavity for it. And that just sounds that just sounds like that's not going anywhere too great unless you're taking it to a professional. And at that point, you're paying them enough money to where you could probably just go get one with it without having to completely potentially murder one of your guitars. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see if we're still going down the line here. This is one of my main workhorses here. This is one of the uh, LTD Eclipse with the uh, Heisel Bridge. So it's just a nice flip of the switch to get one of the best acoustic sounds ever. Um, they've got a couple different, uh, I think one jack is you can route electric with the piezo or just the piezo you can do the different things with that you can blend them with the volume um this one the same company i was talking about um these are like the signature pickups that they made for me they're very very high gain the big rail magnet type so they're very unforgiving it's kind of hot when people ask me to describe them because it's that wide wide range of pickup all the nuance the tap harmonic stuff and and really digging in there it'll it'll let you know if you're kind of it'll expose it'll expose things that might be getting buried with like a compression of an 81 or just not a very hot pickup or stuff like that so that's a pretty sweet little um setup they also coil tap real nice but i don't have that set up on this one but it, it is very this one i think i did almost 100 shows with last year and bringing it into my tech fairly regularly but he's just like the neck hardly ever moved so i mean like built like a tank just really and again that's like the whole like oh it's not the esp or the higher end stuff and it's just like does it work does it does it do the job when it needs to do the job i mean that's the other thing too is some of the gear talk i feel like strays from from like practicality sake of like, but what is it supposed to do? Like, are you just using it at home? Are you taking it out in front of people? Do people know the difference? Like when I cycle through all these guitars in a live scenario, does the, does the drunk guy in the crowd really understand the difference or pick up on the subtlety of, Oh, that's a, that sounds a little bit better than that one. Or I like that one better than that. And, you know, <laughs> backline amps or anything like that. at some of the festivals and shit like that. Everyone's just throwing and going. And just trying to play the songs and and then get to the beer at the end of the night. But um, and then for Repentance is another one of the original bands that's on the profile that you saw. Um, that's the singer from Stuck Mojo uh, and the guitar player uh, that used to be on Broken Hope and Soil and Dirge Within and a couple other things. The drummer, um, our new drummer, you know, Kanky's done stuff with Soul Pie and Kingdom of Sorrow and stuff like that. So, so this one's very straightforward, heavy, brutal. Um, so Sean, the other guitar player, uses Baritone 6. I opted to go 7. So I completely Frankenstein the tuning that if someone else wants to message and figure out what the hell, how they meet in the middle where you can go Baritone 6 to drop A flat, and then I'm using a seven and and it all works. You know, good on you, good for you, music school, all that kind of fun bullshit. But uh, this one's got the uh, a set of the Fishman pickups. Actually, oh, this is the Buzz McGrath on Earth. Oh, cool. The Buzz, the Buzz seven. Um, super sleek neck profile, neck through. The Fishman sound pretty great. I uh, wasn't sure how I was going to like those but everybody and their mother really has been just coming out with signature sets for that kind of stuff and different, different things so like for for even though they do active and passive with the push pull uh i always almost always keep them in active land for the the really super high gain stuff that's where i use the uh the el34 evh is a monster um love that love that amp uh and then also hiding underneath it is the Marshall JMP1 with the 100 watt power amp that will power a wall of shit and and weighs far too much to ever want to leave the house. Like that rack 
holding that in there must weigh like a thousand pounds. That's not going anywhere unless you're getting like three guys and a road crew to, uh, to get that all set up. But, but yeah, you know, I mean, each one different van requires a little bit of a different, a little bit of a different sound and, you know, recorded that new them record with 27 frets and actually worked that high 27th into a solo so now i need that for at least that one song because why wouldn't you handcuff yourself and go shit now i need to use that now it's <laughs> <laughs> dude where so where did you even get that because i hardly ever see those 27 fret ltds yeah that um i don't know if i can de decipher it's either maybe a 2010, just looking at the serial number, I'm guessing it's either a 2009 or 2010. Um, really bizarre, I guess, maybe. Uh, I got that. It was practically brand new. Um, somebody was selling it on Reverb for a friend or something like that, one of those type of things. Like I, I don't remember if the story was that somebody had, had passed or whatever. I think that might have been the case. It was like an estate sale almost or something. That's and they like were just perfect like, for you who's in them. Like, uh, it's perfect. That hopefully right. there's like a, something following the guitar, giving it a little extra yeah. something. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, I did I did record the new album with it. I did a shootout where um, I tried a couple different guitars and wanted to see... I mean, at the end of the day, I'll ruin the magic. Uh, it's just a DI file that gets sent off to get reamped at the studio elsewhere. Um, but even still, you can listen to the chimey behavior of the pickup and the running it through sims, running it through amps, and then kind of doing the guesswork of what will sound best. That one beat out two or three others that cost more money. You know, like it's so. I mean, that's, it's always just sort of the the ear for everything. Um, I did a project where I I cut some vocals at Oceanway Studios in Hollywood, which is United Recording now. Again, a very prolific room. A studio B is like uh, had the Motown piano inside of it. Um, Green Day does stuff there, but Rat Pack guys love that room, all that kind of shit. And they bring out like all these mics, and they're like, "Okay, we're gonna see which mic works best on your vocal." And they're like, oh, this one here is like a $24,000 mic. But this one is only like a $100 or $200 type of thing. And this one is this, that, and the other. And you work through the whole thing. You're like, keep me away from the $24,000 mic. Because I'm sure <laughs> even if you have insurance, I don't want to end up having to, to knock anything over or fuck anything up. But even then, it's that sort of some amps, some, certain bands when you really get into it and and if they tell you what they use. That's the other thing, too, is a lot of bands are endorsed and put out the whole like oh yep here we go here's our wall of whatever and then hiding in the back corner is what they're really using and it's just a lot of smoke and mirrors not quite the fake wall of cabs and all that kind of fun bullshit but you know when it comes to gear and all that it's ultimately what's in your hands and in your head what do you hear and what do you want to hear and you know if it works for you it works for you it doesn't need to work for anybody else Dude, what about the um, that that Epiphone uh, guitar you were just showing me? Where yeah. did you find that thing? That was another reverb find. You got to love that you can just be bored and sitting on your phone and basically end up guitar shopping. Because um, for a while there, a um, couple of years, I mean, more than a couple of years, I've been an ESP guy, ESP artist since, I think, 2015. Uh, but for the years preceding that, I was over at, well, Gibson and Epiphone, and then that got a little hairy with their factories and their stuff. And then I ended up kind of, they owned Kramer and still do. So I had a couple different Kramers at the time and like to kind of keep things in the family. If you're going to be like, oh, well, you know, the way that there's the E2, the LTD and like the Edwards that you have is awesome. Like I'm always kind of looking within the scope of what can I find that is different, but also great and also works within who you're working with. And I was just searching for different things and that Epiphone came up and when I found it, I actually did a bunch of research because I was just like, there's no way that's real. <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah. 
someone must just be making these in in China somewhere, or whatever, and just knocking them off and acting like, oh no, it's relic or it's this or it's that. But no, that was that was definitely just a random. I think I found one more. Which ironic, someone was selling like real close to me in Chicago, which I didn't buy the second one. But you know, the first one I find is you know hundreds of miles away. It needs to be shipped and all that fun stuff. But, but yeah, that one I've had for for quite a while now. It, it, I think it needs uh, the age, you know the age behind it and everything else. I think it could use some some serious help as far as really if you were gonna like road beat that one, but. At the end of the day, I'm like, I don't know. It's old-ish. You know, I mean, now it's kind of like vintage. It's 89. It's not a, you know, it's not a 65 or something, you know, 57 that's like, ooh, wow. It's crazy. But even now, that's still damn near 30, 30. years old. Yeah. That's, that's pretty good. That's not bad. I mean, that's older than half of the people who will watch this. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I mean, I was born before it, but not much, not too far. But um, so that's kind of wild when you're looking at a guitar that's like almost as old as you compared to, you know, the vast other stuff that, you know, if it's new, it's it's better. But uh, it's, it, I mean, I've plugged that in before and run it through a couple of things. It's it's still got some it's still got some life in it. The frets aren't completely shot. So, I mean, I'm pretty sure that's still majority original um but you know you can always you can always mod i don't need to tell you you can always <laughs> you can always find stuff to, to add and tweak with with different guitars and really have fun with it so i guess the moment someone tells me something's not still completely like original on it then i'll be like okay we can we can mess with it now yeah once it's been de-virginized right right once you go <laughs> like well no no those aren't original knobs oh okay <laughs> and, and fuck it, let's overhaul. Let's just overhaul the whole thing, tear it apart, and put it back together. But yeah, not too many, uh, not too many American made these days without there being a superior price tag on it. So it was a cool find for uh, for just something randomly. You're just sitting there randomly on your phone one day, and then all of a sudden that shows up like three days later. You're like, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. What what was your first guitar you ever got? Um, I'm just thinking about how it's pronounced at this point. I'm not thinking about what it was. Uh, an uh, an Aria Pro Two, I believe. Oh no like the, shit! Mm-hmm. That's like pretty yeah. much the same era as that that Epiphone we were just looking at too. That's probably like a late '80s, right? I mean, it was new at the time, but. That's really the, like, I think, I don't want to say the heyday for it, but I think the most sort of impressive slash notable player would have been Cliff Burton. I mm -hmm. think Cliff had a, that was like the bass that he used, because a couple of years ago at NAMM, they were doing a, I think it was a 30th anniversary bass for Cliff, and I walked up to the booth right at the moment that Robert Trujillo approached the booth and picked it up and started playing Orion on it. And I'm pretty sure that's like one of the only videos I put on an old YouTube channel somewhere that's got like stupid views. And it's like an old shitty 3G, uh, iPhone 3 video at NAMM of, you know, the current Metallica bassist playing the, playing the signature 30 anniversary of, you know, Cliff, the whole thing. It's a lot of, a lot of bizarre stuff at NAMM. The things that you see. Oh, it's the best. Yeah. But yeah, that was the first guitar. It was just the candy apple red starter kind of strat shape and um that that's where it all started for me um what made you want to even start in the first place uh so many other people eddie yeah you know eddie just um you know i can't specifically i mean you know slash just growing up and listening to songs that were on the radio and you didn't have to really go too far to find, you know, guitar heroes were falling out of the sky back in the eighties and nineties. Now it's a very different sort of, there's guitar phenoms everywhere. But as far as like guitar, 
as far as Guitar Hero status, I would say it's not nearly the same. It's much more like powerlifting these days than than it is so much like because no one really respects the songs anymore some people will say that that's bullshit but i would say no albums were more important people bought more like that the volume of, of of material purchased by people is where you can kind of see the drop off where forty thousand records in 88 didn't even crack a top 100 now that puts you at like number one yeah it's a different, it's a completely different animal and different world. And yeah, I saw Eddie um, on everyone's probably least favorite Van Halen ever with Gary Sharon fronting uh, Van Halen 3. Uh, <laughs> so I saw that, I saw that tour, but Ed, um, Kenny Wayne Shepherd was the opener. Oh, that is so, pretty sweet. So being a young kid and going to an actual arena and seeing guys play, I won't say completely different styles, but a more blues-based kind of ripper, and then Eddie's just Eddie, and seeing it in that. That's the other sort of, back to my rant about it's not the same, you don't really get a larger-than-life experience anymore. People aren't filling stadiums, or if they are, they're the same people that filled them 30 years ago. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's like, Metallica, Ozzy, Maiden, uh, Rammstein's kind of a newer example, but slightly different. You know, they're the kings of the live show. I don't think anyone touches them, but it's still that sort of more small club. I mean, just look at the Sunset Strip and all the, you know, the different venues that are just gone. Like House of yeah. Blues and Ozzy is gone. That doesn't make any sense. Like, how many places have come and gone that were, like, more iconic than just kind of a random club sort of atmosphere? So it's, um, pick up guitars, kids. <laughs> Not because that's where you think you want to end up and all that kind of shit. It's a different animal. Yeah, it's really crazy, too, to see, like, what the whiskey has become, how it's all pay-to-play. It's, like, not even, like, a legendary place anymore. It's just, like, a... A place where pretty much any teenage band can go in, and it's just, I don't know, it's just, it's, the whole Sunset Strip is a weird vibe now. It's completely different. No, for sure. I mean, the, the pay-to-play thing, that is a, that is a plague that is, that has reached out much farther than places like the Whiskey. Um, that's just sort of a business model these days, which is fucking sad and terrible at the same time. Um, but as you pointed out with the, like the whiskey being like anyone can just kind of go and be and get in there and anyone can do anything anywhere. It's very similar to just the overall vibe of the internet where you go like, how do you compete? How do you cut through? How do you make your presence known? How do you, how are you differentiating yourself from the next person? It's like more about branding than it is a band brand over band. Even though Bruce Dickinson would tell you Iron Maiden is a brand they're very intelligent about how they do their stuff. I mean, look at Kiss. Yeah. You know, if there's anything that can be sold, they've gotten their hand on it. So, I mean, like, it's still a very... And that's why they're still probably around. On top of the music. It's like music maybe secondary. They're running a business. And that's what that's the other thing, too. Any band this day and age is, is 100% just got to be approached as a business. If it's not just a business model and you're not really kind of looking at it as how can we be strategic and smart about this to not lose our ass because no band can survive if you're just constantly hemorrhaging money like if you have the money to afford to do that already you're probably doing better and you don't need to be in a band <laughs> like, <laughs> if you can afford to finance and do all of that shit diy you know at that point a label is just a bank for you and it's just a loan and you have to pay it back, and that's the whole system, and streaming, 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 pennies on the dollar, percentages of pennies, it's just like, it's a very, it's a very different environment, and requires a different degree of patience, I would say, than all of the stories of back in the day, but most of the people from back in the day act like, the perception is still different than what it was, so maybe we're just spinning a different wheel. But 
the, the climate definitely looks a lot different. So when 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 veterans are saying I would want to start a band today, it's like that. I I trust them. <laughs> I'll take the word for them. God, this seems like a nightmare. I wouldn't want to begin now. I'm happy to be ending now. So uh, without being completely depressing about it, it, it's still just a matter of how many bands are you in? How many can you be in? Like, what does it take? What do you like? How how much can you juggle? What are you willing to do? Some people act like I'll never play covers and you go, okay. But quite a few original things, just how do you get, how do you get better at honing certain things like that? Some of the songwriting in, 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 in essence is like, you know, maybe you can learn it. Like some people go to music school or you can learn like 500 songs. Learn licks from different guitar players and different things like that and kind of like have like your own memory bank and library and go like understand how some of the stuff works as opposed to just kind of being like a blind just spray bullets, drive by, hope hopes just throw all kinds of shit against the wall and then call it a song and act like, well, there's one riff and there's another riff and there's that riff and then we'll find a way to piece them all together and and it's a song. It's like, you know, there were still so many different elements to it that you can kind of take from each thing whatever whatever you're willing to take from it, I guess. You know, being in so many tributes and doing so many different songs. Like one one week last year, I think I played with six six different bands, five or six in a week, and it was over seven hours of completely different material. Wow! And it's just it's it'll drive you nuts, but it's just one more way of kind of like exercising everything and going like, well, what what can you what can you offer people when you're trying to be like a whether it's a hired gun or something something similar, you know, establishing like a value and different things. It's like when people are always like, how do you get endorsed by this company or reaching out to companies and asking for endorsements? And then they're like, well, what are your social numbers? It's not even really like, well, oh, let's see a video of you playing or what, what you got an album. You can send us the album to listen to. It's like, well, what's your what's your what's your presence like? Do people pay attention to you? crazy just you know it's a it's a it's just juggling all these different chainsaws and then trying to make sense of all of it at the same time is and then at the end of the day you're still playing guitar <laughs> like, <laughs> remember re- remember to play guitar at the same time where you're like looking at all the different things you're trying to cover and and cut through there it's you know it's still got to be fun for you the moment you stop having fun you're losing it i agree What's going on with uh, with them these days? You guys getting ready to do some shows or record uh, some new songs or how is your writing process? Like, what what are you guys up to right now? Um, we uh, have already started writing the next album. Um, basically, after touring on the first one and learning the entire record and things of that sort, I did my very best to sort of climb inside the head of the other guitar player, Marcus, um, as he had written the whole thing um, and has a style of his own and is very, uh, very technical, very smooth. So it was like sort of a, when I'm writing songs on the, I I did three, I think on the new record, Man of the Seven Gables. And the whole time I was kind of, okay, now rip him off. What would he do? Like, you know, you can kind of come up with parts, but like you're immersed in the the whole sort of texture of knowing what the band is and like how it works and then going like, you know, you can just kind of write riffs and write songs, but it sort of has to make sense and fit within the context of the band. So every time I would get to a certain point, if I thought like, well, this is, this works, then I'd be like, okay, now what would, how would he spin this riff? Okay this note instead of that note oh there it sounds just like it now you know like that's oh, kind of that's like, cool. a, like a tactic that i that i use with that with um with keeping it sort of my favorite thing with putting out the albums is when the reviews come out and people make comparisons to bands and they go oh that song sounds like this band and it's like i've never listened to that band before <laughs> i'm like purely coincidental i don't even know i couldn't name any of the songs so it's just like some it's amazing how other people will listen and kind of have 
I don't know what way we call it, recency bias or just a sort of like everyone else kind of connects the dots in their own way and says like, oh, that sounds like this. Okay. And then you can know how to play like the King Diamond albums and go, no, this isn't anything like that guitar work. Like the rhythms aren't anything like this. And the people are like, oh, it's just like King. And you're like, okay. Like the vocal is a falsetto, so it has to be King. You know, like there's that sort of element where it's so uniquely done that there's not very many people that even get into that register. So you're just bound to be just like, the voice sounds like it, everything is the same. It's like, oh, there's not that much crazy double bass going through those King records. Like there's no. a certain element. Yeah, there's a certain elements where you're going, yeah, we're, we can't, we're not trying to deny it. Like it's where it came from, but... At the end of the day, sometimes I'm like, how are you hearing that and going, that's the same thing? <laughs> like, it's same but different. It's kind of like listening to Megadeth and Metallica and acting like, oh, you know, these are like the same entity. And you're like, they're really not. Yeah, I mean, once people from the outside, I, they always think things are so similar. But when you start getting into it, like they'll say like all the all the, like the screaming metal bands all the same sound the same, and then all the high pitched singers sound the same, and all this. But really, once you get into it, you're like, there's so much subtlety to it, and that's what makes each band way more unique. Is that they other people think they sound the same, but they really are. Uh, they have so much differences. Yeah, I mean the very, I mean, and the first record is very much. Sweet Hollow is very in that, like, much closer to being, like, in the King Diamond clone camp where you're like, well, yeah, that's kind of what that's kind of what it was supposed to be. And then the second one um, was very much, you know, very much less in that vein, uh, much, much heavier, much thrashier type of thing. And people still act like it's the same. You know, so it, it's like I said, everybody kind of takes it and puts their own spin on it and. At least if someone could sit down and do like a side by side and someone grabs a guitar and goes, oh, yeah, there's this riff. And that's just like this riff from this song. Like that would be but that would be work. <laughs> like somebody would actually have to put time in and actually know what they were doing to really explain or like mash up the songs and stuff like that. Like that's that's interesting to me. Stuff like that, as opposed to just kind of blindly critiquing just for the sake of critique to go like all the screamers sound the same it's all cookie monster yeah and then you're like oh sure it is because you said it is and that's no one ever changes their opinion online so once that's been said that's it but yeah there's a new album in the pipeline um right now unless some kind of fests or anything would be popping up uh, I think we're kind of laying low. We didn't tour too much, too heavily on the, the new record, which was a shame, but we've all kind of had some different uh, different injuries, uh, different different things that we've all kind of had to deal with, life getting in the way type of thing. And when you're not really able to afford to just, you know, everything's logistics. Half the band lives in Germany. Two of the guys live in New York. I live here. So it's not really like everyone just gets in, you know, meets up at Starbucks and then, okay, we'll meet at your house. We'll all load the van and then we'll just start driving. Like it's, it's a little bit more difficult in that respect, but we can show up and do a rehearsal day and then we'll play the, go play the show. Man, that's so crazy that you guys live in three very distant areas and you guys are like that you can show up throw some practice together man that's that's crazy i would have never thought that but i've seen some of the videos online um of you guys playing and like it was on a really small stage and i was like your singers in full character i was like man this is so cool i it it, it doesn't seem like people who live that far apart well i mean that's 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 very much one of the uh sort of reasons why it works as a band, I think, because even with all that distance, we can make it seem pretty seamless, I guess would be the right word, where, you know, some bands all live in the area and still can't really get everybody on a rehearsal schedule because 
I'm working Saturday. I'm working this day. I have a show with this band this day. And, there, you know, like there's all that. My, my kid has to go here. On, you know, there's all the different things. Um, but the first Halloween tour that we did, the German, Scott said New York first. Then I showed up. So they did a day where the rehearsal was just drum, guitar, and keys. And then I showed up, and it was drum, guitar, guitar, and keys. And the bass player for the tour showed up. Then we did everything with him. And then before we actually left the next day to drive to Canada to start the tour, we did the whole set with the singer once. Oh, my gosh, dude. That's crazy. And then we did, like, I think Montreal was sold out. I can't remember the theater name or whatever, but... You know, we did the show, it came off, and we were talking to people out, out, outside afterwards, and someone approached me and was like, oh, that was really great, or, you know, I liked you guys, or something along those lines. And and I was like, yeah, that was the first time we played together, like, did a show together. And he kind of looked at me, and I'm like, well, we only played the set once before we came here. <laughs> and that's, you know, again, that's everyone doing their homework, which is a really bad thing for other bands that I've not bands that I'm involved with, but when people kind of reach out and want to talk about different things and they're like, oh, well, you know, we don't, you don't live here or you have to travel or we have to do this. And I'm just like, you don't need to rehearse that much if you all do your homework. Like, if you know the songs you're supposed to do, everybody learns the songs and then they show up and someone counts four or three or whatever and then everyone comes in and then if, if you don't, if you don't know it, you don't know it. If you know it, like, and I'm sure there's probably even still a sense of when, even if you do know it, there's still possibilities for stuff to go off the rails. But, um, oh, especially if one person messes up and everyone else just kind of knows it, then like one thing goes off and then someone else fucks up. And then now the, the bass player has no idea what's going on. I mean, I've seen that happen a million times when I'm just playing with friends or whatever, but we'll co they'll come over and they want to practice together. And I'm like, guys, you got to practice on your own. We come together. And then we could all shred it together without having to like figure out the songs. Yeah, it, um, I, I, I'm turning around because I'm I want to put the phone on the charger so we we don't lose this and have any more technical issues. But um, but yeah, basically, like you said, one person it doesn't take much for everything to just completely just dive into the shitter and. <laughs> um, Another thing that I do with a couple of my uh, working tributes around here, uh, we're all on in-ear monitors. So everybody can hear everything, which is sometimes really bad for people that end up being exposed. Because everyone getting into a room and deafening each other by pointing all the 412s and making as much loud noise as possible. And then the cymbals ring out, and people aren't wearing earplugs, and then you're just, like, completely blown out and deaf. And it's just, then you then you find yourself in a setting when you can hear everybody, and you're like, wait, what What the hell have you been doing this whole time? You've been playing that this whole time? You've been playing like that since, since March? Holy shit. <laughs> that would have been good to know six months ago. So, I mean, like, you, there's all those sort of moments where um, I, I got hired to do a tour with a band in L.A. called um, Malachi. Uh, I think that was 20, that might have been 20, that was probably, I think, 2015. The Halloween tour was right after with them in 2016, I think. But the Malachi tour, we were the opener for, it was an Atreyu tour. Um, I can't re remember which album anniversary it was, but it was like a Treyu, Woven War, Unearth. Uh, I think Beartooth was on a couple of those. That was a great run. But again, like they sent me the material, like I had known the producer slash guitar player to do something completely different in LA. And they send you the material, you learn it, and you show up, and to just be able to walk into a room and play is just. You know, that's sort of the, that's sort of my favorite word. That's kind of like my gimmick, and that's the way to go, is that, like, if you, someone hires you to show up, you can just show up and walk in and be seamless. And that's kind of like what them is on a massive level, where, like, we're all not hiring different people in, but we can just all show up and go, well, we have one day to do this. 
because it's expensive to travel. It's expensive to stay. We don't have everyone's got the scheduling and you're trying to work everything out to be able to get into a rehearsal room and just crank through everything. You know, sometimes when you write the songs, it's like you don't you have to learn to record them. Like we'll split the new them record was still like two rhythms each side. And a lot of those songs, the guitars don't play what the other one does. The mm -hmm. rhythms are very, very harmonized in that sort of sense. So one person goes down, it won't sound the same. Right. You know, and so like, you know that takes two things. It takes uh, uh, talent, obviously, to be able to be, to have the skill to play it, but also professionalism, having the dedication and actually stepping up and doing the work and being a professional. I think that's... Every band should be like that, you know, but most aren't. Well, and that's, that again, like the sort of, in my bizarre sort of TED Talk way here, I apologize, but it, it's very much that the, what you put into it is sort of what you can get out of it with the stage. Like, you know, just even just being able to play, that's not the same thing as sort of replication. And... I suppose that's like a very good sort of way of bringing in like the covers and the tributes where if someone wants to go see something that, Oh, let's go see this band. They play all of these bands. They're playing a bunch of songs. You're like a jukebox for people, but they know what they know. Like people are going to know if you change stuff in like sweet child of mine, you know, like they're going to know if you're playing a song that they've heard a thousand times and you're just kind of making it your own or adding something different. But that same mentality though, going in and going, um, the riff is the riff just cause you can be technically proficient, but if you don't really put the time in to learn the part, you, if you walk in knowing the same part as the other guy, it's not what you need to play. Well, like so like there's that sort of the preparation of being able to do your homework on your own and take it seriously and have that kind of approach where you're valuable everybody is valuable and everybody nobody it doesn't create that like resentment vibe where everyone has like the band that they've been in where every rehearsal someone didn't learn the songs or somebody didn't really put the time in or they kind of know some of it or whatever and especially today everybody can record stuff on their phone everybody's got like the home engineering software to do all their kind of shit so it's not like jamming in a garage and recording it to a cassette and then handing it off to someone and go come on man i wrote this learn this and they're like i can't hear it now you can give people pretty good source material to to really dive in and be like this is what you need to do then the more you do that, the better you get, whether it's at your own stuff or at other people's. Like, that's always, everyone would love to get that dream job where they have that, like, oh, man, I had that dream, and I was playing guitar with this band, and, you know, or every time a band fires a guy or a guy quits and leaves, and everyone's like, oh, man, that would be great. I want to audition for them. It's like, they're going to want to hear their shit the way that they sound. Not so much that, like, well, this is kind of how I play your song. And they're just like, next. Like, you know, whether, they, whether or not they're looking for you to write or be a contributor. That's another thing, too, when certain bands that are larger always have people come and go, and they're like, I wasn't able to write. Like, my contributions weren't being taken. It's like, weren't you just happy being in that big band? <laughs> <laughs> Having the crowd be there and, and, and know all the songs and be, you know, be super into it. It's... It's a weird environment these days, but like you said, like with the them stuff, we just kind of all, we all love it. We respect it. We like each other. We all have fun. And I think that translates in the, you don't lose sleep. You're not stressing over it because you know, when you walk in, everyone's going to know what they're doing and it makes for a very pleasant atmosphere and much less, uh, much less time to be fighting with people about doing stuff and more time to just have fun and nothing better than not worrying about everyone around you. You know, that's like the worst sort of way to step onto a stage. I feel when you don't really trust the guy next to you, 
or you're always wondering, you're thinking about like, is he going to get the part right? Is he going to play the part? Is he going to, is he going to do that thing? Is he going to miss it? Is he going to do it? And then you're like, Oh, now I didn't do something oh. <laughs> because, because I was too busy thinking about this fucking guy over here. So it's very, um, you know, play out, play with people. Just every aspect of everything is just, everything is important. You know, I've, transitioning from studio or bedroom to studio studio to live all that kind of stuff like they all kind of have their different hats and requirements and you know very fortunate to have done what i have done and it's just like always trying to do more and just never being like you know it's that like hunger type of thing sometimes you can get burnt out or sometimes people just feel like they haven't that's the other thing like sometimes it, you, people look at other people online and think like oh these guys are doing something, they must have made it, or it's like overnight, or they got a break, or, you know, I never knew who they were, so now I know who they are. And I, you know, get down on myself. So they could have been doing that for 10, 15 years. A lot of bands get signed after like two, three, four, five albums, and then they start to get bigger and stuff like that. And really fortunate that I didn't grow up at a time where I could have watched every eight year old smoke me on YouTube. <laughs> learning to play guitar where you just like how do you play this like we were lucky to find horrible tabs back in the day where it was like the internet was first creeping out with all that kind of shit now it's just like people always come up to you and go have you seen this kid have you seen this kid and i'm like you trying to ruin my day yeah it's crazy <laughs> i hate that but also i mean if we would have had those tools we would have been those little kids too right you know you know but that's why some, sometimes you think maybe that's where People get discouraged easier or something like it's just, I mean, we had John Petrucci to make us feel like shit, like <laughs> watch it, watch stream theater live. If you really wanted to be either motivated or just want to stop Marty Friedman, you know, there were always those guys, but they didn't look, I guess, as young at the time or something like that. Or, you know, like you said, like, who's this? Can you do this? Can you do that? And get tagged in this video and that video and, yeah, it's always it's always a process. You can always I, I actually uh, without getting in too into this story because I really can't. Um, I had to relearn how to play a couple of years ago, so that was a very interesting sort of process. Without getting into those details, as far as waking up one day and not being able to do the same shit you used to be able to do. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So having to really dive back in having a pre-existing knowledge base was very helpful because then you're playing things and going like, you know, you can do stuff, just getting back into a practice regimen and like regaining the strength and the muscle memory and being able to do things and playing like a completely different person. It was very weird. Um, but again, like you can find the, uh, you can find the motivation to just always learn. Like that's when, I think Alex Skolnick from Testament, I saw something once where someone asked him, like, why don't you play a seven string? And he said, still learning six. Yeah, I've seen that. Classic answer. And it's just like, some of these guys are still just freaks, but they keep pursuing it. So it's like, if they're doing that, you know, practice, 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 <laughs> come up with something, you know, but it's, it's, Finding finding ways to keep it interesting and fun and not being frustrated no matter what level or what what's going on with writing songs or playing parts or listening to Nevermore and going, hey, that's a fun Jeff Loomis part. I think I'm going to, no, I'm going to leave that alone right now. Right. <laughs> yeah, so. Dude, Marcus, you're awesome. Uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on, man. I'm a huge Them fan, dude, so... Well, thank you, I and I'm, I appreciate you letting me ramble. It's the coffee. I apologize. <laughs> Dude, I'll listen to you ramble any day. This has been amazing. Um, I, I know you have johansonshreds.com. Uh, you have at johansonshreds. Um, yeah. Every, Steam Hammer Official. Well, I mean, like, um, everything for me, like you said, johansonshreds.com, and then and every handle on social media, Twitter is at Johansson Shreds, Instagram is Johansson Shreds, Facebook slash Johansson Shreds. Um, 
the website has a more cohesive sort of schedule of tour dates, no matter which band it is. So uh, the, the really funny part for most people is that I play guitar in a boy band. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's, that's a very uh, interesting sort of spin off of extreme metal and death metal and the, them being kind of theatrical and thrashy and um, all Are the there different videos acts. of this on your website. Um, there's probably a few sprinkled through Instagram for different things. Cause I still have a couple of shreddy kind of heavy moments that I throw in the set. Uh, I, I Easter egg a lot of stuff in the boy band. So there's a one direction song where I play a little bit of do host in it, but no one knows. So I, I, you know, I play it, I can hear it. I laugh and I keep playing and no one in the crowd knows. And it's just like, yeah, that's funny. That's there. Um, all those fun little things that you can just kind of sprinkle through. I mean, that, again, the bull stuff is almost all written by phenomenal songwriters because none of those guys were responsible for most of their own shit. Uh, so Max Martin type people that could write, write people just in and out. Um, and then you kind of understand them better. Like I've, I learned so much by having to learn these songs that were written by people that, put a decent amount of technical work into something that sounds mm, some of it's generic, but I mean, some of it in the eighties and nineties, I, again, songs from a period where people gave a shit. So there's some, it's not, they're not all three chord bangers type of thing. So, but yeah, all the different bands are all listed on there. Um, all the fun web stuff, endorsements, Instagram, it's just really just like a, a, a profile of shows and gear, you know, fun, fun new stuff that I'm dealing with. This is, I'll take this opportunity real quick. This is my newest little uh, addition here. This is from ISP. It's the uh, Michael Sweet from Striper. It's a call their Theta Pro all-in-one unit. I, I played on it at NAMM, and I couldn't walk away. It was it really, without getting too gimmicky, that's very much my sort of go-to now where I'm trying to implement that into the shows and stuff like that for like sounding like a tube amp within within a box. Pretty sweet. Um, then having everything just being like wired in there. It's not as effect heavy as like line six shit or the, the axe effects and stuff like that. I know you've got some you know, Marshalls, right? That's so your, yeah. Uh, yeah. I got an axe effects too recently. And I'm like you were saying earlier, man, it makes things so easy. Yeah. I mean, you can also complicate the hell out of it. Don't get me wrong. Like, you know, I mean, it's very easy to get caught up in that where some people are like, I spent two hours trying to figure out how to route shit and I didn't even play. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, there's definitely that element of it. Um, but, you know, when it comes to different gear and shit like that, impulse responses, that's a gimmick. That's a great third party thing there where people are doing the, the load boxes or the two notes torpedoes and everyone going direct and everything like that. There's so many, so many pieces to a puzzle where everybody's like, how does this, how does this band sound like this? And you're like, pretty, very elaborately. <laughs> like, yeah. No matter what, no matter who's playing where, there's always either one small piece. Like we've done fly gigs where we've seen people with those little moor pedals preamp into a power amp and like the whole pedal board is like this big and that's how they do a fest and then there's wow. you know walls of yeah it, it, it it's very the more you get into it the more you realize you probably don't need it but uh i mean i love the tube amps and i love all that shit but you can't fly all this stuff everywhere and bad kinds are always different and you know how much how much can you do with less keep making it smaller and smaller and smaller and see like remove the crutches remove like all the practice on a clean amp you know practice with just the guitar by itself like there's all these different things that i just re-implemented for myself after i had to start relearning everything um you know clean everything like i said with the pickups it's like harsh harshly unforgiving just like the more you can hear everything that you're doing the more you can hear what you need to fix <laughs> yeah, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, and and it's just part of the process. But but yeah, there's there's all kinds of different uh, gear stuff on the pages. Um, 
I usually end up fielding messages about different things. So if anyone has any questions about like how to wire shit up or MIDI routing and all that kind of fun business or making the making the effects units work with the real amps or controlling way too much time spent on all of that stuff, man. Reading all those manuals for no good reason. <laughs> so but no, it's it's all tons of fun getting immersed in all that stuff. It's like porn. You're porn all day. It really is. <laughs> All right, Marcus, dude, it was it's awesome talking to you, man. Thanks for coming on. No, thank you for having me. Again, really appreciate you reaching out. That was awesome of you. And, uh, yeah, uh, hope hope I made sense for most of this. I, I apologize for the, the run-on sentences. <laughs> yeah, no worries, my man. <laughs> I'll talk to you soon on Instagram. All right, sounds good, man. Talk to you soon. Cool. Have a good night, man. You too. Thank you. All right. See ya. All right, guys. Well, that's it, man. Thanks so much for, to Marcus for coming on. Thanks again to SpongeBrick for uh, setting me up with them. And check out them if you guys haven't checked out them and you guys like metal. Uh, definitely check them out. They're theatrical, King Diamond-y. Um, but more of the new stuff is heavier even. it's Like he was saying, it's got double bass, all kinds of cool stuff. Check those guys out. They're awesome. And, uh, of course, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Leave a comment down below if you enjoyed this episode. And maybe let me know some gu guitarists you would like me to have on in the future. Um, go to guitarguts.com. You can get my albums on there. And you can get the T-shirt, the guitar, wall mount, all kinds of stuff on there. Thanks so much for watching. And I'll see you guys on the next episode.